Hi everyone. Um, my name is Stella Ling, and I'd like to, Dr. Stella Ling, I'd like to welcome you to our session where we have continue our conversation about the role of the model, the prototype in architecture and fashion design. This is my colleague Cole Pei. Hi. Um, I work on the architecture Bachelor of Architecture Studies program at Tago Polytechnic, and often uh, Stella and myself are present in various student crits and. It sort of led us to a conversation about commonalities within our practices or disciplines that work um, in an educational framework for a professional um, discipline. So we're going to talk about um, the role of the prototype. And this came out of a long series of conversations that we've had. And what we realised is that architectural education um, emulates or replicates professional practice in the classroom. And um, this happens in two ways, one through learning about topics and one through experimental design. And mostly this happens through active 3D modelling or making of designs in a physical way. So really, when we first started talking about this, we were it was really based on um, our experience as outside um, reviewers. And for me, it was about more often than not, it was about how how quickly the uh, lecturers in fashion examined the artifact or the student's artifact at a very detailed, critical level as opposed to or before they understood the contextual relationship. So that was a really interesting approach for the model for me. Yeah. And so we realised that in fashion, the model is called the twirl, and it, it, the initial twirls are quite um, rough and ready, made in a cheap fabric, they're all about silhouette. But the final fashion twirl generally emulates as best as possible um, the a garment as you would find in a professional space and that architectural models don't work in this way. One of the major differences we um, discovered through talking was the materiality of the model. In fashion, the students would use the real material, the real fabric, the real textile technique, and they will sample this full-sized and test it on a body. So architecturally, it was really about understanding what's the purpose of the model in an architecture education. And it's really about helping students see, see architecture in a three-dimensional way. And in that, in that way, the sort of models um, respond to ideas around cognitive drawing or they undergo a series of interrogation. So the loose, rough, ready to more formalised as the ideas themselves concretise. We're going to skip through now and talk about scale. So we um, seems obvious, but we wanted to point out that it, both architecture and fashion use the body for scale, but we do this in very different ways. So in fashion, the body is generally one to one. There, there are a couple of approaches where you model very early on in one third or one half size, but usually one to one. They're headless, they're armless. They replicate, they mirror, um, they're a neutral mirror of the self. And this provides a bonus that most of the time the fashion that's been developed can be tried on a real body. So architecturally, this is sort of not possible a one-to-one -one scale when we are examining or critiquing ideas of design. So for us, really, the human body is represented as um, a universal form but they are defeatured forms. They stand in, they're anonymous. They are 2D silhouettes um, as the three-dimensional mannequin that fashion students utilise. So we also realised as we were talking and having this conversation is that the model was a thing. Um, well, the model was a plan for a thing. We talked about the thing versus the plan. We realised our students never made, either the fashion students or the architecture students, they never physically made the real final design. They never executed it in a commercial way. They only ever made a plan for it, whether that plan be 
a prototype garment that had all the features and details that a final one would have, or whether it was in this case, um, all of the documentation and the models and the details required to build a building. So in this way, architecture education approaches architecture as an imagined space. And therefore the emphasis on the documentation um, identifies whether a, the plan is good or bad. Yeah, we thought that the plan demonstrated the professional ability of the student. And that's one of the ways that we use the model in both of our programs. Um, materiality in fashion has a very different role than it does in architecture and here in this design the student had to use a sheer and drapey fabric as part of developing the design. There's no way this design would have been able to be refined or resolved if the material had not been this final material as they were working. So architecturally the idea of materiality is is always assumed, but often not um, evident in the early iterative process of models. It's more about the relationships between the container and the function. But as the um, as the form starts creating or contextualizing, therefore we start seeing materiality being simulated. One of the things we needed to include in this, though we're specifically not talking about it, is the um, let me just get this video started, is the role of the digital in both of these spaces. So in fashion, the digital hasn't really been a big part of um, the way that we prototype or model until very recently. And this is um, a student's work from this year. And what I remember in terms of how it was responded to by lecturers is the wow factor around these empty garments walking and modeling clothes, rather than any discussion of the design or the technique or the scale. Um, and Cole, you've got some comments on Yeah, because this really um, reminded me that it's, it's quite common practice in architecture education to have digital work walkthroughs. But when we were talking about in the relationship that Stella experienced through this work, it reminded me of Yanni Plasma's um, commentary that of digital, um, digital architecture as skin architecture and I thought that was a really nice relationship to to the digital realm. So we just wanted to continue our conversation a little bit more face to face because it's such a strange space to be in, this digital space here, um, and we wanted to bring in the, some of the theory that we've included in our full paper and of course with the 15 minute presentation we can't give you the depth that's going to be in the full paper but there are a couple of concepts around the experience of making and what can be learnt and how designs can be better through making. And so from the fashion background, we're pulling in the theorist called Dunnigan who talks about critical making and the how handling materials and physically testing things out by making them um, gives practitioners a body of knowledge that they can then use in their designing. And there's a similar body of theory yeah. in architecture. And Yoni Plasma in particular through his um, book called The Thinking Hand really um, discusses this cognitive relationship that you develop through the physical making of form as opposed to um, alternative practices and it was really he's talking about this experiential of architecture and for students like us like we said earlier without the ability to test at full scale it is through the physical making of of models as drawings that we understand it architecturally I'll just return to our examples here So one of the things we realised is really, really important is scale, and um, and part of that is critical making. So Cole, can you tell me a little bit about this example here from architecture? Yeah, I, I was talking to Stella about how it's always about the, it's almost seen as a negative response that how we don't have um, the ability to test at a one-to-one -one scale, but we can through uh, simulated experience in virtual um, virtual programs, but also it's really critically explored through the detail model. And the detail model is actually really important educationally because it is, in this example here, the students were um, asked to 
pick out a particular aspect of a previous design that they'd been reviewed through so that they could explore an, a segment or a fraction of the architecture example at full scale. So this detailed modeling is where students understand what they're doing, and thinking and creating as, as architectural. One of the things we realised as we had this conversation that has been going on for a couple of years as professionals between us is that the model can only ever be a model, whether that is a full-size garment prototype of a design or whether it is one of these smaller models that are um, used in architecture. And we've got a couple of examples here and the one that I want to talk about is on the right. And when I first approached it, I mentioned to Cole that I really liked the way that the student had um, modelled the trees in such a, a subtle and um, stripped back way. And Cole let me know that they weren't actually trees. It was a subterranean building and that these poles that I had recognised as trees were actually um, the contour map. And so I realised that that I was approaching it as a model where I looked at it and that I was thinking these things represented full size things rather than as a, a terrain model. And Cole wants to talk about the one on the left. So the one on the left for me is actually what happens at the at the end of the education in the use of the model. And models are in terms of um, performance seem to um, take a more artistic approach at the end. So instead of learning through the models, which they do through studio practices, at the end the problem is that models are placed on a table or a plinth and they're looked upon at instead of within. And that is really, again, responds more to an architectural model as object as opposed to a model standing in for something. Which brings us to this final model, which is absolutely gorgeous in the flesh. Um, and Cole referred to this as a plyscape. And maybe the one thing, apart from how much labour has gone into creating the, this ply terrain, is that the, the design the, the, the building maybe makes up one hundredth of the proportion of this model. Sort of challenging thing that I have with these models, or they are beautiful forms in themselves, but it reveals the truth of what these models are. And um, that truth is that they render the complex relationships between landscape and built form mute or inert through the application of materials and through the, um, the, the miniaturization of the design itself. The crafted landscape takes over the design response to that landscape. So as we come to the end of our presentation, um, we just wanted to reaffirm that models um, are not there to emulate architecture as they are in fashion, but their purpose is to cognitively bind the designer to examine the built form as an extension of the drawn form. form. And the design model is different, but equally valid in each area. Repre referencing the, the, the profession for which it prepares its students. So there's some sort of um, dialogue around the relationship of studio practices within architecture and fashion schools in the future but it really is for me as a as a education it's vital that students get to experience different ways of interpreting architecture through different modes that allows them to understand architecture beyond a drawing yeah so these are the our final um, references and we want to thank um otago polytechnic for um, supporting us in this research and being able to present in this way. Um, and we look forward to, or we welcome questions. You can email them to us at our um, institution, which is Otago Polytechnic in New Zealand. Um, thank you for listening. Yeah. And we hope that this um, is it's only the beginning for us of thinking about how we use models in our classrooms. And we hope maybe it makes you think about the way you use models in your own classrooms. Thank That's you. Great. Thanks.